Hi, thanks for having us. Um, we were talking about the metaverse protagonist. Thank you for coming. Um, we were just joking earlier that if you took a shot for every time someone said NFT protagonist or uh, avatar at this conference, we'd be face down on the floor <laughs> drunk by like 10 a.m. Um, but I apologize, apologize if we're going to say it a lot <laughs> in this presentation. But um, so we're going to talk to you today about techniques for developing um, first person narrative content for the metaverse and some of the lessons we learned creating a project together. Yep, and we're just wondering, it's hard to see you guys out there, but do we have a lot of like creators in the room or? Yeah, okay, cool. Sweet. Really good to see you. <laughs> um, there's a lot of work to be done, but we're, uh, we're really excited about what we did with this project and where we're going. <clears throat> so together, pre-pandemic, we created Forensic Detective. This was um, the very first non-linear interactive augmented reality app for the Apple App Store. And it's success. One of, one of the okay. first, yeah. <laughs> she's, she's my I'm legal uh, yeah. guide. Um, <laughs> but uh, but um, yeah, and the, the success of it was unpredictable. And um, we're very proud of that. But we created it for the Oxygen Network. Um, they were going through a rebrand where they were a woman's network. And they rebranded to a true crime network, which was pretty much a network about women mm -hmm. who murder their husbands. Um, and we created this augmented reality uh, experience. It was a nonlinear interactive where a crime scene appears on your floor. There's a dead body. There's evidence on the floor. There's bullet casings. There's um, bullet holes in the wall. There's fingerprints. There's um, suspect's testimony. But then there's also a suspect board on the wall. So your mm -hmm. object is to walk around in any order you want, interview the suspects, find the evidence, inspect the evidence, pin it to which suspect you thought did the the crime and do that before they get away. And the fun thing about this project too is because we, at the time I was with NBC and we uh, really, there were other crime AR projects out there actually despite what Brett would have you believe. No, this is the only one. <laughs> but the thing about this is it wasn't really like, it wasn't rooted in game playing, it was really rooted in entertainment and at that time, as Brett was saying, like true crime was taking off. People were actually solving crimes in the real world. And we just took sort of the experiences one had when watching Law and & Order and applied it to AR. So uh, it was a little bit different. You can see it's more like TV based in a way. Yeah. So since we were making something that um, had never been done before, uh, there was no use case for this. We never had a pipeline for doing this. We had to figure out a lot along the way. and. Um, the purpose of this presentation is to like walk you through the lessons we learned so that hopefully um, the problems we had, you won't have to resolve them. And of course, you know, things have changed a bit since pre-pandemic. Uh, one of the great things is we have 5G, as mentioned uh, at Verizon. That's one of the reasons I came there. It really is in order to have AR experiences in the real world, 5G is one of the components that you need. What we're waiting for is more ubiquitous hardware. Uh, the device, clearly, the phone alone, limits how much time you're going to have the experience. A lot of times, a lot of AR projects I work on, you'll see like the, the average time spent is maybe 40 seconds. You know, So it's a lot of work for 40 seconds. Um, but once we get glasses, we feel that will change. Yeah, and speaking of, does anyone think that the Apple glasses are coming out this year? Or, okay, we got one. We have it on <laughs> next year. Okay. <laughs> good source from over there. It's like almost <laughs> coming. Um, well, we can't wait, and we've also like working with we work with Snap at Verizon, and you know obviously we're so impressed with a lot that you can do with spectacles, even though it's just like a small step into feeling like getting AR into the glasses is really exciting to see. Yeah, and as the devices do penetrate the market, you know the growth growth wasn't as exponential as everyone early you know, predicted VR headsets would be or AR headsets. But um, I think it's telling that people that come up to me that aren't, you know, nerds like all of us and say, you know, what's this metaverse thing and why did Zuckerberg create it? And you're like, oh my God, die. <laughs> um, but their kids have like Oculus at home and they're playing games on these things. But these are people you would never expect to have in their house. And it just keeps exponentially growing. And that for storytellers, that really provides us a new opportunity to not just make games, but to make interactive stories where the user is the protagonist of these stories. And this untapped market is, is 
going to be revolutionary, whether it's the next two years, the next five or 10 years, um, but it's gonna happen and now is the time to kind of you know, learn the tools of the trade. This thing isn't working. Um, so like I said, along, along the way we learned a lot of lessons and we did, had to do, go rogue and do a lot of things ourselves. Um, and I hope some of this information will be a little helpful for you tonight. The first issue we had to solve was storytelling. So um, as you know, you, as, as you're the protagonist of an interactive story, you know, everything's happening from your pers perspective and there's, um, we created a, like a nonlinear sandbox where the user could walk around and discover mm -hmm. clues, talk to people, uncover things at any, at any time they wished in any order. So this posed some challenges with creative interactive stories. Um, so there are three, three specific types of storytelling models that um, we discuss that are pretty common. One of them is open world. If you've done you know, any kind of MMO like Warcraft or anything, you know what an open world is, but basically the, the author and the storytellers create, you know, they build the world that you're gonna live in and the users craft their characters. They can do anything they want at any time. We chose a limited world where, um, because of budget and timing, we had to craft an experience <laughs> that was in a very small, it was in a very small space. Um, but this this allowed us to create very a very confined world, so you couldn't go anywhere and do anything. But then I'll tell a little bit of um, like story moments could be more intimate because you know we had a very limited length experience in a limited um, space. Where the string of pearls which is an interesting one. I don't know if a lot of people have heard this before, but if, if this is mainly used for interactive storytelling. So if you think of a necklace, it has you know, a string and it has pearls. So if you're telling your main narrative in an interactive story and you get to a decision tree, instead of having branching narratives that go in many different directions, as a producer, if you're trying to craft all of those different branchings for your narrative story, it gets unwieldy and very expensive very fast. Um, so if you're pitching to someone like uh, Netflix, you have to actually have those considerations in mind and how you're gonna limit that branching narrative. And the way to really uh, gaslight your audience without them knowing <laughs> is to create a string of pearls where your, your narrative structure is, is going in you know, the forward direction, you have a decision tree moment, and then you go off into your tangent and you come back to the narrative again. And you seemingly have, as a user, have the, the feeling of choice, but you're really only producing the main narrative and the extra branches, which keeps your budget in line. Um, we did not do that, but we created the limited world that kind of has a little bit of both. Um, point of view was an interesting challenge to overcome. Um, you know, this, is, this has been done in uh, VR, you know, a lot of times before and after us, but um, you know, it, when you're making a movie, the cinematographer and the storytellers get to craft, you know, what shots are set up, and you know, we craft the story based on you know the cinematography. Where for us, you know, the the user, the protagonist, is the cameraman, so they're walking around and choosing the shots, um, and they seemingly can look at anything at any time. So one of the devices we used to kind of um, narrow their gaze was to dim lighting if they were you know meandering around too much and we wanted to focus them on a clue that they're keep missing so we dimmed the lighting and almost spotlight things not a total spotlight where it's the only thing in the room but just like dimming the rest of the world a little bit and focusing on one area really helped us uh, get the user's perspective into uh, what we wanted them to focus on and that, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that, you know, coming out of the game world and digital worlds, people are so, you guys know this, but people are so used to making games or experiences that just live on the device. But what's exciting about AR is really using the device as a way to enter the world. And working with Brett's team, you know, he's got like a theatrical, I think it's great to work with theatrical people as you develop AR, you've got like, you know, a stage downstairs at a studio and everybody's got like this great acting <laughs> mentality. So you really have to bring that kind of sense of theater, I think, to the projects. Yeah, and additionally the drama, speaking of that, that we use, or sorry, a device we use to increase the dramatic moments um, is sound effects and music. So uh, when you're playing the game, you may not notice it, but as time is running out, we actually increase the beats, the music, and add layer in more tracks so that it gets in more intense as it goes on and you start running out of time. Mm -hmm. 
So I was talking earlier about uh, the user journey. So those branching narratives, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with like, you know, a diagram of, you know, branches that go into different nodes that you have to make decisions, especially if you're a programmer, you're used to this. But um, again, we had a limited time. We've made, you know, applications before, but since the story was so crucial to the user journey, they're kind of entwined. We had to be real nimble and agile about how we're crafting our user journey. So again, this is pre-pandemic, so we really uh, benefited by being in the same room to, together. So within a day or two, we literally acted out all the characters. We actually had props in the room and we built the space hmm. in our studio so that we could walk around and literally do make-believe <laughs> with the characters. And we had a whiteboard on the side of the room so we could draw all these branching narratives, create our list of clues and props, what the cesspuck said here and what this other person said to kind of have misdirection in our storyline. And we mapped all of that out in live time and we were able to erase things. Um, if we did it today, we'd probably, you know, do it over I guess. webcam and use Visio or something to create that tree. But if you have the opportunity to go to West Reading, Pennsylvania, <laughs> I it, like his studio is so great. It's like in a bank and the servers are in the vault. So <laughs> there's like a whole creative vibe with Brett and his team. Um, but yeah, I guess we would do a lot of it remotely, but it, you, you can't take away the being together yeah. too. So when we think of wireframes for VR and AR, um, again, we wanted to be super nimble when we were crafting this experience. So we, we it, and it didn't make sense to spend budget for artists or 3D artists to actually create the room while we were writing the narrative because the room and where the clues are and everything was very was crucial to how the story unfolds and how the user played in the space. So we actually used Tilt Brush to go into VR. You know, we drew out where the, the body was, where the doors were, where all the evidence was in the room. Um, and we could do that within the hour. We have a whole new room. And then uh, uh, we, we let other people come down. Chris came down and, and actually got yeah. into the headset. And she got to um, play through it and like feel where everything was. And the, the bonus of this is that we could export an FBX file, give it right to the developers and also the, uh, the Blender artist so that they could be working in parallel while we're prototyping. And it's, it was just nice to be able to have this like nice little uh, cycle of people working together at the same time. Um, I mean, speaking of iteration, like if your application development with testing, the, the most important thing you can do is, you know, build something dirty and iterate quickly, use temporary assets, um, anything you can to get the user flow in place so somebody can test it and you can test it to make sure, hmm. you know, it's working correctly. Um, Especially here because it's not proven, like how do people interact with these, these worlds? There's not like a common user interface. So we had so much testing we thought like, oh, people will get this, and then you guys know, like you, you get them in to play, and they're like, ah, now what? So yeah, yeah. We had, I remember we had one build that had music in, it was a stock music. We had voiceovers, it was just us doing it. We had all the assets in, the whole user <laughs> flow was there. We thought it was so cool, so good. We we're like, this, we're ready to go. I gave it to someone to test that didn't know anything about this thing. They started tapping around and playing with it, and they were like, I don't even know what to do. Why did you make me do this? I hate you, dad. And um, so I made it better. And, but yeah, her, our kids are the <laughs> testers. <That's> the <laughs> but, uh, but no, she, she, we did learn a lot from seeing people without bias use it because you know, when they're fumbling around and you're watching them and not helping them, they make mistakes, you're writing them down, and that will help you fix it. If, you're just, if it's just us working on the same thing forever and we go to test it, you know, our bias just kind of clouds how it's actually working. And I think that led to some of the success. Yeah. And speaking of user interface, a challenge um, that's very interesting in UI design these days is um, how user interface works in AR. Uh, because when you're working in VR, you know, you have hand controllers and your screen is on your face. So it's very natural to walk up to an interface in 3D and if it's too close, you move it back and you can click the buttons and move things around and brush things or things are on your hand. That's very intuitive. In AR, you're already set back because you're holding a device. Now you're walking around with this device. If something's in the, th if uh, UI is in the 3D space and you're trying to interact with it, it's extremely awkward to try to tap it or um, while you're holding a phone. So 
we actually solved this with kind of like a hybrid where we put the, um, the initial evidence that you're going to unfold, we had a label on it, and you clicked the button and it opened up the flat UI on your phone and you could play the little mini games or you know, figure out what the evidence uh, was and pin it to a suspect on the UI element um, on flat on your screen instead of the 3D space. And that also gave the user a little bit of time to breathe because they were holding this phone up while they're playing this game and it's just pretty cumbersome. Yeah. But I think that's something that um, when we have glasses, um, that'll solve itself because you will be able to walk around, we'll have hand tracking and we'll be able to click things in the 3D space. But the phone, we do that a lot like in other projects we're developing now where it is this hybrid, and I guess like Pokemon Go does it too, but like you're using the, the phone to interact with the world, and then it like brings you something to play on the screen. So it definitely increases engagement. Yeah. So we didn't go through the whole process of application development because we don't have all day. But how did it work out? I liked it. Were you it. happy? I liked it a lot. Do you As still the like client, me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we were very happy with the results. Um, so <laughs> Uh, we basically, you know, Apple loved it, which is always feels like, yay. Um, and they featured it in the App Store. We got a lot of editorial placement. It was number two in, in the entertainment yeah, or just in general? Yeah, it was number two not in AR. It was yeah. number two in entertainment. In eight weeks, it went from, you know, nothing to number two. And Netflix has thousands well, of pieces of content in it. We had one story. It was really good. So that was, that was pretty neat. It made me feel pretty good, especially because it, you know it's Oxygen Network. They didn't have a ton of money to put into something like that. And then we get an accomplishment for them. You yeah. know, that's very exciting. It wasn't like no money, Brett. <laughs> well, no, I'm sorry. I keep harping <laughs> okay. on that. But it was, you know, yeah. there's a lot of people here that have million dollar budgets for their projects. Right. This was big for us. But this was a little In comparison step. to Netflix. Correct, correct. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. You can go. Yeah. Oh, but yeah, but the uh, so everyone, every we you know we got thousands of ratings, all of them four plus. The the, the biggest, biggest complaint was people were like, we need more story, and that was like music to our ears, and we were like, we need more budget. Yeah. Um, but it, yeah, I mean, really, the the project was people just were like, they wanted to solve more crimes, and uh, I think it's a very successful format and one you know, that has a future in AR, for yeah. sure. And Forensic Detective might not have, you know, more stories in its future, but it's really exciting because that means people want to hear your stories. Like, we don't have to be the ones creating the stories. It can be all of you going home, taking this knowledge, and just creating something because people want to experience this. Oh, and the time spent, I alluded to earlier, oh, like yeah. 40 seconds is a lot of times the average you get with, like, just an AR thing. This only had about seven minutes of content, and that was the average time, so, like, you know, I think that's always great when you can. Yeah. And people did it more than once, even though, um, you know, it is one story. Yeah. So where does this take us into the future? We need to do <laughs> I more. I love this guy, by the way. And the other, he's the coolest guy. <laughs> in every one of his videos, he's like clicking in the air and tapping on stuff. He still looks cool doing it, but that's going to be us in the future. We're all going to look like lunatics, like the no. people that live under the bridge, grabbing things in the air, <laughs> talking about the aliens that are coming for them. Yeah, it's like when we first started talking on our phones, right? <laughs> yeah. Everyone's like, well, who is she talking to? Um, but yeah, there's some things that get me excited about like, uh, like having characters in the room with you that are all AI driven and um, you know, voice recognition so you could have people in your stories that are you know, your partners in the, in the stories. Yeah, I mean, I think if we're, is the next slide where we're talking about things? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah that we're working on. We're starting to play around with a lot of these new tools. Um, and as you can see, like we basically at Verizon, uh, we're, we're, we've been working with uh, creators in the immersive space. Um, if you look here over the past few, few years, these, these are really projects that we've done that are in the storytelling space. We have other projects. We work closely with Snapchat and we started with their landmarker lenses, and then of course Niantic doing some of the first mech-enabled um, multiplayer games. Uh, really, I don't know if Erin Keating's in the room, but she runs Next Gen Content for Snap and is looking at ways to integrate. Oh, there she is, hi. Everyone who has great ideas, go see Erin because <laughs> she's looking for them. Um, but basically, how do you take a, a story, and this one is really like imagining the future, 
and using AR in the future, and then also incorporate AR lenses into that story. So we were really excited to partner with Aaron and the team on that. Had over 10 million views, so that was awesome. Next up for us, we're working with Viola Davis's team on something called Iago, which is a modern retelling of the Shakespeare classic. It's um, a Tribeca finalist this month, so we're really excited That's about awesome. that and its category. We've been working with Simon Fuller, creator of American Idol, on his passion project, which is a alien named Alta B, which is a kind of a digital twin of a choreographer he works with. Um, so this is really, she's sort of like leading people into the metaverse, and, and that's got AI built into it, and that's, um, we did like one video with her. Uh, she, she joined her band Now United and did this jump video, which had like 50 million views, mostly in Brazil. But <laughs> um, basically, we're doing more with her in the days ahead. We have a project with Doug Lyman's team coming out next quarter, and it's really a bit of an evolution Pretty from cool. what we worked on. Yeah. yeah. And Keiji Matsuda, who many of you may know from um, the famous hyper-reality movie, we're working with him and Niantic and Unity on a uh, shared AR multiplayer game slash experience. So we've got a lot, and you can see how the technology is progressing. We're delivering on the 5G. We're waiting for the hardware to really make this all come together. So, um, you know, but in the meantime, we're excited to tell stories uh, in using AR and other new, new, new tech. Yeah, and at Neo Pangea, we have various projects for in the stages of funded to begging for funding. <laughs> so um, <laughs> um, our natural evolution of Forensic Detective is called Bleeding Edge. So that is a cyber noir crime thriller. Um, we're also making, on the opposite side of the spectrum, Extra Chinese Terrestrials, which is um, a slapstick sci-fi comedy about these adorable little aliens that are up to no good. Um, and then the History Glitch is a very dark comedy where an AI becomes sentient, convinces you that humanity should no longer exist on the planet, and you help them destroy the world. Oh, so now you're the antagonist. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Next presentation, <laughs> the metaverse antagonist. Cool. <laughs> See you next year. Um, <laughs> so if you have any questions or know of any tools that might be an evolution of you know, what we totally made up years ago, um, please reach out to me. No unsolicited scripts, please. But um, any questions or you know, need any advice, or I'll try my best to help. Um, but I'm excited to just you know, be the protagonist in your stories. So. And we have a couple minutes left for questions if anybody has any. And or to the drinks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> to the drinks. Thank you. Okay. Oh, sorry. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Jerome Morrison. I work for Meow Wolf. Um, no, oh, don't know sweet. if y'all have heard about that. And woo, found some fans. <laughs> um, so one of the the things that I've realized over the last, really the last year, is the difference between storytelling and world building. Um, a lot of the narratives that come out of that, the narrative team at Meow Wolf is very much focused on telling an interesting story about a family or something like that. But I've come to realize like what this presentation is, uh, like um, about how the protagonist is the guest that's going to come through our spaces and not necessarily some other character that's in the story. Hmm. So I'm curious, how do you approach world building for the individual who's gonna be playing the game, so specifically like in The Forensic Detective, what were some of the thoughts that you had, not necessarily for the storytelling, but for immersing them in the world, for finding those, those elements that is content agnostic? Yeah, that's a really good, that's a really good question. I mean, some of that evolves out of the writer room, but I think the first inspiration for this story was actually, we were premiering it in Nashville, so we got, oh, that's right. we, yeah, we got a lot to work with, with setting our scene in Nashville um, and I think he was a country music star yes, and his like best friend was cut out of the album and, um, and but you know there was a lot of like uh, misdirection with his girlfriend do it because she was actually asleep. Um, I shouldn't give away the ending, yeah. sorry. But <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna play it. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of that came, a lot of the world came out of that user journey where we were all able to sit together like a television writer's room and just brainstorm and um, she was alluding to, without making fun of me, that we have a whole costume department. So we That's literally great. get into costumes. You gotta come visit. It's so nice and, <laughs> and really we, good food. We just get wild in a room <laughs> and stuff happens. And sometimes, you know, some of it, it's great to have 
a little bit to work with, like, you know, like Nashville and, yeah. and, and pretending, you know, um, to be these characters. I think writers are really important. And, I, you know, just in my own experience, oftentimes when I work with, let's say, more of a traditional agency, it's a bit forgotten, you know? They just start with, like, a lot of the design. And, but, like, at the, if you start with the, with the writer's room, I think it really helps. Yeah. But how are your writers approaching that in a way that is putting the user forward and not so much the, like the, all the other characters that you're talking about in the story? Like yeah. What are the elements that you have for that user to come into that world? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. So the, that's, for us at least, you know, this isn't everybody, but for us it's like um, we actually pay a lot of attention to improv in our process. So we, um, there was a, before COVID, every single morning we did improv for 10 minutes after the Monday meeting. And we trained each other to just bounce us off. Uh, sorry, doing improv every morning um, helps people be quicker in conversations, helps them be better prevent presenters, but it also helps them kind of think on their feet. And by doing improv with that team, we were able to just kind of like, you know, play make-believe in a room. So it was less, less about traditional, like, writing like if we if we were yeah if we were producing a uh, just an interactive video that didn't need space and it wasn't non-linear we probably could have had a writer from the beginning kind of draft a draft and maybe a story arc and that would have been a lot easier but since this was kind of like non-linear and an open sandbox it had to be a little bit more um, I don't know played out and also like in this case the protagonist is like something everyone relates to you know like uh, law and order whatever you're going into a crime scene so there was something about just like creating that world and letting people enter it i don't i don't know there was you did create a world yeah. that people entered it it wasn't so specific to the user but then the user stepped okay. into everything they learned about becoming a detective you know cool. and their you. desire Great to answer. solve a crime thank you so much thank sure. you so much okay is that, I think we're done. I think it's, nope, thank not. you. Is there anyone else or? Mm -hmm. Oh, one more. One more. One more question. No more. Oh. <laughs> one more, no more. <laughs> okay. Okay. I guess that's it. All right. Thank, thank you. Thank you guys Thanks so for having much. us.